Good morning. It's a pleasure for me every week to welcome our friends at Fresh Start Mall Campus and Fresh Start Watkins Glen. Let's welcome them right now. This weekend, we are blessed to have a, a guest teacher, preacher named Karen Busby. I consider Karen kind of a, a daughter of Pennsylvania Avenue United Methodist Church. Uh, some other church claims her too, I think, but uh, today she has our church shirt on, so I told her that we're not going to give her back. She belongs to us. Karen's uh, been a, a friend and a sister in Christ that I've come to appreciate very much over the years, and uh, we have a strange and wonderful relationship, you know. She's strange. I'm wonderful. But uh, I say that because uh, she'll give it back to me, I know, as well. Uh, we've, uh, we have served on a few uh, Closer Walk or Koinonia teams. And there was a time that I actually stole her notes. And she threatened me with my life if I do that. So I want you to know I'm putting them right back here on the table. And uh, we're, would you please welcome Karen Busby right now. Good morning. It is such a joy to have been invited here to speak to you this weekend. If you don't know me, I do consider myself one of you, especially now that I have a, a nice t-shirt here. This is my second home, and it truly is an honor to be here to participate in your summer series, Seven Words from Jesus. I know last week you had a special guest, so you took a pause from the series so I just want to give a quick recap about what has been covered in this series so far. You've been looking at the seven words from Jesus in these statements are the dying words of Jesus as he hung on the cross. Pastor Bill reminded us a few weeks ago that these are not to be considered Jesus' last words because he was resurrected, yet they are his dying words. The first week, Pastor Bill looked at the word forgiveness. The first thing Jesus said from the cross was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The second week looked at the word of assurance. In this important message, we looked carefully at the phrase, today you'll be with me in paradise. I highly encourage you, if you did not hear that message, to go back and to listen to it online. This message looked at how to have an absolutely no for sure, under no condition, no doubt, that you'll be going to heaven when you die. This week, we're going to look, be looking at the third word, which is love. Love is what Jesus showed to his mother, Mary, who is standing at the foot of the cross as he was dying, and to his best friend, John the Apostle, who is standing there next to Mary. Think for a moment about this scene. Jesus had not had an easy few days prior to his crucifixion. He had not slept in days. He'd been arrested, tortured, put through trials, I could continue, but I think we all know that he was in a sad state by the time that cross was lifted up. As Jesus is put up on the cross in front of a mocking crowd, there are very few people there in support of him. All of the disciples had left with the exception of John for fear they too would be arrested. Jesus looks down at his grieving mother and his best friend, and he quietly says what we find in John 19 verses 25 through 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Joseph had died a long time ago, leaving Mary a widow. It is believed that after Jesus' death on the cross, Mary lived about 12 more years. During that time period, John the Apostle took care of her because of this statement. Jesus' intent in this statement of love was for Mary and John to take care of one another. It may be an easy message to miss or look past, but we know the words of Jesus are important and are full of meaning. What Jesus is doing here is showing his deep concern and the deep concern of God for all of us when we are in pain. It shows God's compassion. It shows his sensitivity. It shows his attention. It shows his tenderness. It shows his love, and it shows his concern. We learn two things from these verses. The first thing is what it means to love like Jesus. 
The second thing is that we are never alone in our pain. God is right there by our side. So now we come to our notes where you will find four things that we need to do in order to love like Jesus. Just as a disclaimer, what we are going to talk about in this message, you cannot do in your own strength. You cannot love the way God loves without God's power in you. You cannot do it on your own. You need Jesus. Because we are outside at our main campus this weekend, I took the liberty of filling in the blanks on your outline for you. I'm sure you're going to be disappointed in that. But please feel free to take down your own notes if you wish. So number one, in order to love like Jesus, I must care for my own family. Love is not something you just say. It is something you do. It's a verb. If you think back to the passage, Jesus did not say the word love. He demonstrated it. In the midst of undeniable pain, Jesus does three things for his mother. He notices her and calls her out by name. He honors her and provides for her practical needs by giving emotional support. The first way that we can do this sounds so simple, but if you are like me, you're going to feel a bit of a sting from this one. We can love our family like Jesus by paying attention. Attention is one of the greatest gifts you can give your family. Attention is far more important than things or money. You can always get more stuff, but you can't always get more time to pay attention. When I was first working on this message, I thought of my two nieces. And for those of you who don't know me, I have two small nieces. They're six and eight, and they are a pretty big deal in my life. Whenever they want to talk to us, they have this habit of always starting with our name, even if it's just seconds apart. So they'll say, Aunt Kiki, and they'll tell me whatever it is they want to tell me. And then two seconds later, Aunt Kiki, and they'll tell me whatever it is they want to tell me. They'll even go so far as at a family gathering to go to each person in the family, call them by name, and say what it is that they want to say, however many times there are people. What are they looking for? Acknowledgement, attention. They are seeking to be heard and understood, and they make sure by using our individual names that we are focused on them when they begin their story. They are inviting us into their world, and to them what they are about to say is incredibly important. They want to make sure we're listening. Attention is the greatest gift that you can give anybody. We can never get our time back, so if I'm giving you attention, I've just given you a part of my life. It's the most important thing that you can give anybody. It tells people that they are important. They are more important than anything else that is going on. We live in a world full of distraction, full of things that are begging for our attention on a consistent basis. We need to make the choice to put our phones down, turn the TV off, put our work away or our books down, to look at the people in our lives eye to eye and give them the attention that they so desperately deserve and need. Ouch, right? I felt super convicted of this in the last few weeks, so I keep reminding myself that it's not in my own strength that I will do better with this, but when I continually rely on Jesus. The second way we can show love like Jesus to our family is by meeting their practical needs. In this passage, we have Jesus' last will and testament. He's meeting the practical needs of his mom. At this point, Jesus has nothing to give to Mary. He doesn't have any wealth or home or even clothes aside from what may be on his back. He has nothing to give but his friend. He entrusts them to one another. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This is an ultimate verse that demonstrates loving like Jesus. Loving like God is taking care of people who can't take care of you, who can't give you anything back at that point in their life. Many of you who I know in this congregation are doing or have done this with your aging parents. It's hard. It is hard to love like Jesus would love while simultaneously living our individual lives. Yet, 
That is what we are called to do. I have witnessed both of my parents take on the caregiver role to their aging parents, the role of making hard decisions for their parents' well-being and ultimately how they would spend their last days on earth. If there is any love that comes close to loving your own children, I believe it is the tremendous burden and gift of loving your parents during that difficult season. When they are helpless and unable to care for themselves or make decisions, when their roles reverse, it was incredibly difficult to watch my parents make these out of love decisions. I had the honor of spending a great deal of time with my, uh, one of my grandmothers during her last six months. She repeated herself often. She didn't uh, get around very well and needed a lot of help with the most simplest of tasks. She was sometimes a little bit cranky, and God taught me a great deal during that season about my grandmother, about myself, and about loving like Jesus. What a gift he gave me in that season. The third way that we can love like Jesus in our families is by giving emotional support. Think about what the scene looks like for Mary, Jesus, and John. It is an incredibly tender, beautiful moment for the three of them. Jesus is there hanging on the cross. Mary is standing there in front of him, brokenhearted, as she watches her son suffer incredible agony. I know I'm not a mother, but I can only imagine what that must have been like for her to witness. I can, however, relate to John. He, here stands John, Jesus' best friend. He stands there looking up at this man he knows to be the Son of God. I imagine he stood there asking, why? Why does he have to go through all of this pain? Why do the people want to torture and ridicule the Son of God? They are in unmistakable emotional pain. I love the message's translation of Proverbs 17, 17, which will also be your memory verse this weekend. It says, friends love through all all kinds of weather, and families stick together in all kinds of trouble. Underline or circle the words, stick together. That is the way you show Christ-like love in your family. You stick together. You show up. You stand up, and you hold one another up. Mary and John did just that. The mom and the best friend stepped up when everyone else flaked out. That, my friends, is love. To some degree, this brought an ouch out of me as well. Loving like Jesus means putting our family's needs first. How are you doing at that? How am I doing at that? I can tell you that this is an area I know I need to grow in as well. So in order to love like Jesus, we need to love our families by paying attention, meeting their practical needs, and giving emotional support. To love like Jesus, I also must treat other believers as my family. Now, it's one thing to love our families, to protect those closest to us. The Bible says that real love is learning to treat other believers in your church family as actual family. Now, before I continue on this, I want to say that I truly believe that you here at Pennsylvania Avenue are really, really good at this across all campuses. I'm sort of an outsider, so I felt like I needed to share that perspective with you. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, blood is thicker than water. That is true, but guess what? Grace is thicker than genetics. Our physical families will not last. People grow up, people move away, divorces happen, people die. There are many reasons why families disintegrate or fall apart, but our spiritual families are going to last forever. If you follow Jesus, we are all family, and the Bible is clear that we need to treat one another as such. Matthew 12, verses 48 through 50 says this in the message translation. Jesus didn't respond directly, but said, Who do you think my mother and brothers are? He then stretched out his hand toward his disciples. Look closely. These are my mother and brothers. Obedience is thicker than blood. The person who obeys my heavenly father's will is my brother and sister and mother. We are all relatives in the great big family of God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? 
1 Timothy 5, verses 1 through 2 says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Do you know what that means? It means that if we are genuine followers of Christ, it is each of our responsibilities to serve the older believers in the church and to mentor the young believers. I didn't write that. Don't hold it against me. Jesus leaned on Mary as a child, and the Bible tells us that John, the beloved disciple and Jesus' best friend, leaned on Jesus as a disciple. And now, Jesus tells them to lean on each other. We aren't meant to do life We are meant to do life together, to be devoted to one another. Paul writes in Romans 12, 10, be devoted to each other like a loving family. Excel in showing respect for each other. Just as a side note here, you may or may not realize that Jesus had four half-brothers and two half-sisters. I don't want to get into why they're half-siblings today, but isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't leave his mom in the care of them? Hey, ma, or, you know, hey, brother, Make sure you take care of mom. Isn't that interesting? If we look back at John 7, 5, we learn that at this point, his brothers and sisters did not yet believe. It was only after the resurrection that his siblings became believers. At the point of the cross, he chooses John because John is a mature believer. We read in Galatians 6, 10, whenever we have the opportunity to help anyone, we should do it but we should give special attention to those who belong to the family of believers. One way we are called to do this is by giving emotional support. Galatians 6.2 says, Share each other's troubles and problems, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. In other words, we are to do life together. We are meant to go through life and carry one another's burdens. No one should be an island doing life alone in the body of Christ. How can we do life together if we aren't in life together? What do I mean by that? I mean, if you are in a growth group, if you are invested in the lives of others on a weekly basis, you are cheating yourself and you're cheating the family of God. You're cheating yourself from being loved on by your brothers and sisters, and honestly, you are cheating yourself the blessing of loving on others. Of course, you can love others without being in a small group, but there's something intimate and special that occurs when you meet with that smaller group of people on a regular basis. You grow to truly know one another and begin to do life a bit differently. A few years ago, I was uh, going through some medical things, and I was keeping a pretty tight lid on all of it at first. My friend Lori texted me and said, you need to allow the people in your life to be praying for you. You're robbing them the blessing of walking with you in this season. She was so right. So shameless plug, and I was not told to put this in here. Shameless plug, when growth group signups start in the fall, get yourself in one. Next, to love like Jesus, I must learn to see others' pain even when I'm in pain. Think for a minute about the last time you were sick or in physical or emotional pain. Were you thinking about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Did the thought cross your mind that there are so many others who may be struggling in a much bigger way? It's possible, but probably not. When I am sick, I am the only thing I think about, and all I can think about is how to get through the day without dying. And I'm just being honest, I am not a good sick person. When we are sick or in pain, whether it be physical, emotional, or even spiritual, we become pretty self-centered. But God says that if you are going to learn real love, to love as he loves, love like Jesus does, you have got to learn to see others' pain even in the midst of your own. Let's go back to the cross for a minute and just recap what has been taught so far in this series. Jesus is there hanging on the cross, There is no pain that we can possibly imagine that could compare with what he is and has been enduring. Yet there he is, noticing the pain of others. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then to the thief next to him, he says, Today you'll be with me in paradise. He notices the thief. 
recognizes the pain and torment that is happening next to him, and even while he himself is being tormented, then he looks down at his mom and his friend. He sees their pain. It is easy for us to pull into a shell and close ourselves off from others when we are in pain. Yet Paul writes in Philippians 2.5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means even in the midst of my own struggle and pain, I should be looking at those around me, looking for those who are in worse pain than me. That is not easy. But remember, we cannot do this in our own strength, but only with the power and strength of God in you. 1 Peter 4.1 says this, Since Christ suffered and underwent pain, you must have the same attitude he did. You must be ready to suffer too. For remember, when your body suffers, sin loses its power. We are called to take whatever pain that we are in and use it to help others through theirs. It is an amazing and beautiful thing when you work through a struggle in your life or a season of pain and then turn to use it to help others through their season of hurt. I'm heavily involved with two recovery ministries at my home church, and this is something that we continually see. We see people who have come through the pits of depression or the lowest of lows in alcohol or drug addictions, broken marriages, etc., take what they have learned in their season of pain and use it to help someone who is in the midst of their own. It is a beautiful thing to witness. And do you know who benefits from that? Both parties. Number four, to love like Jesus, I must meet others' needs even if mine aren't met. This is a completely countercultural idea to consider. I must meet other people's needs even though my personal needs are not met. At work, at home, at church, walking down the street, wherever we are. Think about Jesus on the cross one more time. He is hanging there, and the entire time he is thinking about others. He doesn't go into himself and focus on how great his pain is. He doesn't turn from the pain of those around him. He is looking to comfort those right up until the very end. What does it mean to love like Jesus? Romans 15 verses 2 through 3 say, Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? Think about this for a moment. What if we went through our day looking for Jesus disguised as a hurting person? I am willing to bet every person here can think of someone they interact with on a daily basis or a place they go on a daily basis where someone we know is hurting. They could be in your workplace. They could be at a soccer game sitting next to you. It might be the person behind you or waiting on you at the grocery store when you leave here. They could be sitting in the seat next to you right now. The point is, if you want to find Jesus, you need to be aware of those around you and begin looking for him in those who are hurting around you. Maybe you just need to be willing to be willing to notice. It's amazing what we see when we become willing to see. Romans 12, 13 says, When God's children are in need, be the one to help them out. Get into the habit of inviting guests home for dinner or if they need lodging for the night. I want to challenge you this week uh, to take this message and do something with it that demonstrates loving like Jesus. Who can you tangibly show the love of Christ to this week? Maybe make someone a meal who's going through a hard time. Buy the coffee for the guy behind you at the drive-thru. Invite someone to breakfast or coffee who just needs to chat. Make a phone call. Write a note. Love someone like Jesus this week. It doesn't matter what it is you do for them. What matters is that you demonstrate the love of Jesus. I know some of you who are here are in a place of struggle as we speak. I want to acknowledge that it truly is difficult to think about anyone else when we are in that place of pain. We have all been there at some point in our lives. Perhaps you were grieving a loved one or a job or marriage or other relationship. Grief is grief and it comes in all shapes and sizes and does not discriminate. We can learn three things from this passage, though, about our times of grief. 
First, we need to remember that Jesus cares about our grief. Even while on the cross, he was focused on the pain of those around him, and he sees you and cares about your pain as well. Secondly, accept the love from others. While in a place of pain, you need to accept the love from those around you. It goes against our grain. You may want to build a wall to suffer in silence and close yourself off from those in your life, but that is not the way. Don't rob the people in your life the, breath, the blessing of praying for you and journeying with you during your season of pain. Families are meant to stick together, to take care of one another, to show up when no one else will. This is your family, and we want to know what is going on in your life. That is just one reason that we ask for prayer requests and praise reports every week. We can't help if we don't know. Finally, in the midst of your own grief or pain, look for somebody else who you can come alongside and help. Yes, there are some here who are in great seasons of loss and pain, but the reality is that there will always be someone else in the world in greater pain. Jesus gives us the power to love like him, to help others even in the midst of our own hurt. Mary and John would have missed the blessing of Jesus if they hadn't been close to him. Had they closed themselves off and grieved away from the foot of the cross, they would have missed the comfort and the blessing that Jesus provided. The answer to our pain is always at the foot of the cross. Whether you've followed Jesus your whole life or are just beginning to explore the idea of being a follower of Christ, it all starts at the foot of the cross. This message has been packed with ways that we can grow to love like Jesus loved. We cannot do it on our own strength. We can only do it with the help of Jesus. What is it that he's calling you to do differently today? Who needs to be seen and loved in your life? Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we just thank you for uh, your word, Lord. We thank you for um, the blessing of this community that we are a part of, this family of faith, Lord, where um, we are here to serve and love one another, God. Lord, when we hear messages like this, it's easy to walk away feeling those stings and convictions, Lord, of the things that we need to work on in our own lives. But, um, Father, let us not forget, uh, along with those um, stings and convictions, Lord, of the great love and grace that has come from the cross. Lord, we uh, thank you and we praise you for um, what it is that you have taught each one of us through your word this week. And we just ask that you um, help us as we go forth this week and really take that challenge to heart, Lord, that we would um, purposefully find someone um, in our life that we can truly love and show your love to this week. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you've done, for all that you are, Lord, and uh, for all that you've yet to do. For it's in the Son, your Son's name that we pray. Amen.